Appreciate our band. Appreciate so much. Appreciate those that help get the cars parked and get the grass mowed out there with the kids right now. Appreciate you being here. You could have been anywhere else this morning. Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28. Are you comfortable? Do you put yourself in Scripture? I do. I can read a story and put myself there. In Matthew 28, it's been three days, 72 hours of wondering. <sighs> Was it all true? I saw him walk on water. I saw him raise the dead. I saw him heal the leper. He said, Put this body in the ground in three days, I'll rise again. He talked about his hour. He talked about his cup that he'd have to deal with. And now the culmination of it is on this morning. And the scripture says, after the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went off to the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven. And going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. Let's ponder something a minute. Just, let's just ponder this moment. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven. Do you wonder if there's weight in heaven? Huh? Do you ever wonder? Is there weight in heaven? Are we going to be weighty in heaven? An angel came down, and when he hit the earth... It shook earthquake. Oh, wow. And then he rolled the stone away and he sat on it. Second thought are there smart aleck angels in heaven? <laughs> huh? Because it's got to be, man, that he rolled the stone and he sat down on it. He sat right there, man. Just, his appearance was like lightning. And his clothes were white as snow. Somebody said, Pastor, why you wear black all the time? Because when I get to heaven, I probably got to wear white. <laughs> the guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. Sixteen guards. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> for I know that you're looking for Jesus. You didn't come here looking for your daddy. You didn't come here looking for your cousin. You didn't come here to the gravesite looking for anybody else but Jesus. I know who you come looking for. You came looking for Jesus. Who was crucified? You see, there were a lot of Jesuses. There were a lot of them. There was only one Jesus Christ. But there were a lot of Jesuses in the day. Just like in, in uh, South America, Jesuses, which messed me up being from Alabama. When I got here, I thought, how dare you name yourself that? And then I realized it's cultural. He's not here. He's risen, like he said he would. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he's risen from the dead yes. and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. You will never go to a place that he's not been. He said, I'm going before you in the gallery. I'm going to go somewhere you ain't been. When you get there, I've already been there. I'm preparing a place for you that where I am you may be also. Said that to his disciples. Father, I love you. Thank you for your word. Your anointing rests on my lips. Our hearts to hear and receive. Don't let this be a religious day. Don't let this just be another day. Let this be a day that we're reminded that your resurrection changed everything. In Jesus' name. Everyone shout. Amen. God bless you. you. may be seated. There were three things that I've noticed that the resurrection changed in our lives. First was our doubts. Second, our guilt. And third, understanding death. His resurrection had not happened. Christmas would have no meaning. 
All the other holidays would have no meaning, the holy days. The Christmas, you know, it would be an obscure just little story. I mentioned it yesterday online. Perhaps there's no mystery in the universe so monumental as God dying a death, dying a death of shame to redeem mankind. You know, it's one thing we want to die with honor. We want to die in such a way that, that uh, perhaps nobody would talk about it or video it or something of that nature. When Jesus died, he died on a cross naked. His body was covered. The only thing that covered him was his blood. And it had congealed to his body. He had been beaten by a cat of nine tails. He had been pierced into the crown. All the things that he had gone through, amen, for us. But this question of doubt. As a young man, I was not brought up in church. I did not understand the gospel. I didn't understand gospel people. Um, it, it just, it was foreign to me. I've often said that I've, I went to church. I remember as a family in Alabama twice. The first time we went to church, a fight broke out in the parking lot. Uh, and then the second time we went to church, nobody fought, so my dad quit. <laughs> That's how boring church was. So I've made it a passion of mine to try to make sure that you're not bored in the house. Amen, that you understand that. This question of doubt, modern men and women ask with great sincerity, how can I know which religion is right? It's a fair question. Uh, I have a daughter now that's in uh, Turkey, and uh, she's reaching and, and trying to reach out to those that are of Muslim faith. Amen, that's, that's her passion, one of the places she's at. But it, this question, the average person today faces an abundance of supermarket religions from which to choose. I went with my wife to the supermarket for the first time in a long time. I walked through the, um, the cereal aisle. Back in the day, there was Frosted Flakes and Raisin Bran. I walked through there, and I was blown away. I was struggling, struggling to decide which cereal is the best cereal that I want. And then the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, they're great. And I grabbed <laughs> Tony the Tiger and threw him in my basket, and I wouldn't look at another cereal as I walked through. Religions can often be that way. You know, there, there's only one problem. When I think of all the different bottles of, of religions that are out there, that, and, and all the bottles have been poisoned except one. And how can you find the right one, the pure one? There's Judaism and Islam and Buddhism and Baha faith and Taoism and Hinduism and Sikhism and Slavic and Neo-Paganism. There's Wicca, Satanism, Hellenism, Jehovah Witness, Mormon, Scientology, Unitarian, Confuciusism. And then they throw Christianity in there and say, just, just go pick you one because it doesn't matter which one. It matters because yes. only one resurrected from the grave. There's such foolishness out there. People are trying to invent different religions. I, I mean, there's a, the church of euthanasia. That's not one I want to go to. The church of the flying spaghetti monster. I saw a young man who had written on his T-shirt, I'm going to hell in all religions. I agree. Because Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. It's having a connection. It's taking away and removing all doubts. And it is a crucial question because at the surface there seems to be no great difference between Christianity and all the other religions. But there's one fundamental difference. It's one fun, it hits one fact that sets it apart from everything else. It's the roll call. When you yelled out, Muhammad, here, in the grave. Well, if you yelled out, Moses, Moses, still in the grave, his bones. Buddha, grave, Confucius, grave, Jesus, Christ, not here. Come on. Not here. They went to the tomb. He wasn't there. The, the, the angel rolled the stone away. This stone, it took these 16 soldiers to roll in front of it. It was a huge grave. It was a Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. It was a borrowed tomb. Somebody said, why would he be in a borrowed tomb? If I'm not going to keep it long, I'm going to borrow it. Hey Amen. Ain't no need me owning this thing. So they rolled the stone away. It wasn't to let him out. It was to let us in. And then when he flipped over on the side, it's like an earthquake here. I mean, it's just like for those three days, finally something happened there at the, at the tomb. It, and it was an answer to all of our prayers that inside there, he wasn't there. Only a folded napkin was left which was an indication that he would be back soon. So when I think about all of my doubts, 
this is the thing I, I dwell on over and over. It's the resurrection that took away my doubts. When I do funerals, if I've done a funeral for any of your loved ones or friends, lift your hand. Every funeral I've done for your loved ones and friends who I knew knew Jesus, I stand on the hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. The fact that we will see them again, that they may have died, but they ain't going to stay dead. Amen. They're not going to, well, it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's the only hope we got. Amen. I, none of these other guys offer any hope. They offer confusion and hatred. And Jesus, you know, and that's the thing, is, is learning to love. He put, he put this love in my heart when I didn't have it before. Well, being a grandson of a bootlegger, you come up with this idea, you hate people, particularly other bootleggers. <laughs> Amen. So this thing inside of me tells me over and over again, it was Jesus that changed my life. And guilt. What about the guilt? Don't tell me you don't have guilt. Some of you, bless your heart, you can't even keep it off your face. Some of you are really good at hiding it. But the rest of us is like, we had our hand in the cookie jar and there's guilt all over us. We feel it. Someone once said, there's no doctrine of the Scripture that is so easy to prove as the doctrine of human depravity. We do not evolve. We devolve. You leave us alone long enough, we just get worse. We need something that will stop us and push us toward righteousness and toward God and back to where we ought to be. We need something that will do that. And the only one I know that do that is the resurrection of Christ. You've been knowing what he's done in your heart. Pick up a newspaper, turn on the TV, listen to the radio. Think of the people you work with every day. Or better yet, look in the mirror. The evidence is so plain that no honest person can deny it. The reason we feel guilty is because we are guilty. Come on. Amen. We are guilty. We, we all deserve. The Scripture tells us all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's no one righteous, not even one. Amen. So we look at that. Listen, that is there is no, no one who can claim to have lived an absolute perfect life. The record of our failure haunts us day and night. It whispers to us in the darkness. It shames us in the light. Sin stalks the trail of every person born on the planet. Amen. No one's born without sin. No one lives without sin. No one can claim to be totally free from sin. The question is not, am I a sinner? Because the answer is always yes. The question is, how do I get rid of the guilt that I feel in my soul? We try all kinds of ways, don't we? First, we try to do good. Oh, I have met some really good people. I had somebody say the other day to me, they actually said this to me. They said, it's okay, we're going to heaven, we're good. If good will get you to heaven, then who set the standard on good? Who set the standard where good is? Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. Come on. For us to work out our own salvation, to figure this thing out ourselves. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. Well, we're good. We hope to even the scales, so to speak, by being a model mothers and exceptional fathers. We work with the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts, the Cub Scouts. They, they contribute to the community chest, the United Way. We mow the lawns of other people. Amen. We pay our debts on time. But we work hard on the job. In short, we're fine. Upstanding citizens who help make the world a better place. Thank you. Appreciate that. But here's the problem. By doing that, you've negated what Jesus did on the cross. Amen. He died for your sins. If he would have said, you know what, y'all just be good and I won't have to go through all the punishment and the beating and the loss of blood and the humiliation and the spirit. I'm God in the flesh. I wouldn't have to do any of that if you could just be good. I, I can tell you this, I can't be good enough. I had somebody cut me off this morning on the way here. I'm in serenity. <laughs> my radio's off for the first time that I can remember in my life as I just meditated since I wasn't talking to my pastor this morning. I turned my radio off. And some black little <sighs> diesel rabbit <laughs> decided not to stop and just cut right out in front of me. When he did, I don't slow down. That's not my prerogative. I'm not good. I let my car keep the same, my truck keep the same speed, 60 mile an hour, drove right up on his back end, looked him right in the eye. <laughs> he bumped his brake, and I did this, which was saying, you pulled out in front of me, idiot. 
He's waving back at me. I'm on my way to church. You know what I'm thinking? So is he. So here's two guys that are both going to hell. Both of us need Jesus. Can I get an amen? I mean, we can't be good enough. Second, some people try to cover their guilt through the pursuit of pleasure. All for these people, life is one nonstop fraternity party. We're going to, to, to Mexico. We're going to, to, to the Bahamas. We're going here and there. Everything's happiness, lights and music. They laugh. They talk. They keep on moving. They are in perpetual motion because they fear that if the lights are ever turned off, if the laughter ever stops, if the noise dies down, they will have to face the hard facts of life. That's why some people turn to alcohol, drugs, pills, uppers, downers, artificial stimulus of every kind. It's the only way they can deaden the pain. And third, some folk just become religious. I'm not talking about, I'm just talking about being religious. You know, they talk about prayers and they're lighting candles and they're burning incense. I was burning incense long before I met Jesus. <laughs> All these answers fail because they don't deal with the root problem, which is sin, and the true moral guilt that exists between all humanity and a holy God. Nobody get around the issue. So you can't be good enough to erase your guilt. You can't laugh enough to drown out your guilt. And you can't pray enough to cover your guilt. Can't be done. Only the resurrection answers the problem of guilt. And you say, but, but I thought it was the death of Jesus that forgives us. Yes, it was. But, but dying was one thing. Had he just died, if Jesus had not risen, then the Romans and the Jewish leaders were right when they crucified him. If Jesus didn't come back from the dead, then Calvary was just another execution of a well-meaning but misguided religious leader. Without the resurrection, Good Friday isn't good. Yeah, And death of Christ forgives sins, but only because the resurrection has made his death effective. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures but after his death it was his resurrection that sealed it for us amen that's the power of do you want forgiveness and release from your guilt listen first you got to look to the crucified you got to look to the one that was buried and rose again look to him amen and then this thing about loneliness this is the fourth largest city in the world i'm um, excuse me in, in america houston texas and there are people here that are lonely there are people right here in this building with all the folk here that are lonely. When I, when I think about it, where can I find a friend? How can I find someone who cares for me? Amen. It, it's not hard to understand. We're all in this fast lane. We get up, we get dressed, we go to work, we come home, we unwind, we eat supper, watch TV, we go to bed, we get up tomorrow morning, we do it all over again. It's just a rat race. We live in such a fearful society that we never really get to know our neighbors. We put up fences. I went over to visit a lady uh, two weeks ago here in Crosby, and it was in, I call them bedroom communities. They're all over Crosby in this area. And, and, and this man who I love, no Vietnam vet, he walked outside with me, and he said, Pastor, I don't know that neighbor. I don't know that neighbor, and I, I've never seen him come out of the house. He said, I come out, I work in my yard, nobody talks. Everybody's quiet and withdrawn. It's cocooning. We just cocoon. We just go back and, and we, we stay in that place, but we never reach out and make friends. And then we ask ourselves, why don't we have more friends? Because we've not been friendly. Oh, Amen. We just run up on the back end of little black <laughs> diesel rabbits and wave at them. I just wanted to make a friend. People wonder what hell will be like. T.S. Eliot calls it the great void, the land of ugly nothingness. We might imagine it as one place in the universe where you are utterly, totally, and eternally alone. You scream and no one answers. You cry for help, but no one hears your voice. You fall in, through darkness, you're alone. That's what hell's like, the place of utter aloneness. Other churches may not tell you there's a hell. I believe there's a hell. I believe there's a place you don't want to go to. But I'm more concerned about heaven, about the kingdom of God, than I am about the dark places. Can I get an amen? 
against that awful reality stand the words of Jesus in Matthew 28, 20. I'm with you always. But don't forget what he said, those words on this side of the empty tomb. After he had already come back from the dead, those words have meaning only if Jesus is alive. If the resurrection did not happen, then Jesus is not with us and we're truly alone. Then he tells us in Hebrews 13, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So the question of death, and I'm going to start closing up here. 4,000 years long close. 4,000 years ago, Job, who I affectionately call Job, said, if a man dies, will he live again? That's the greatest of all the questions. It's the central question Easter was meant to answer. If a man dies, will he live again? I mean, I don't care what faith, culture, race, just humans. Ask yourself the question, if I die, will I live? Is this all there is? There has to be more. This body every day gets a little older. There has to be more. Every experience. Yeah, you ever experienced the cold, clammy touch of somebody whose spirit has left their body? You ever went up and just touched them in the coffin and laid your hand on them? It's almost like you can knock on wood. It's, you know they're not there. And you, you, you would cry over that body. And, it's, and, and please, don't be offended at this moment. But we were created from dirt. We're just dirt bags. And it's, oh, I'm very sweet. Because <laughs> I'm going to tell the truth and shame the devil. Come on, that's, not my, that's not who you think it is there. They're gone. Their spirit is with him now. Amen. They got a brand new body. According to, The word of God didn't leave us without answers. It, we, we got this brand new body. But, but that experience, that cold, clammy, waxing feel of death, there's no movement in the nostrils, no twinkle in the eye, no smile on the lips. Death feels terrible, unreal, unnatural. When we stand over the body of someone we love, we feel helpless, angry, defeated, afraid. Death is sober and frightening and terrifying. No one of the Scripture calls it the last enemy. It's the last enemy. Deep in our hearts we wonder, how will we do when our time comes to cross the great divide? How will it be with us when we have to go through the valley of the shadow of death? Will we be afraid? Will our faith stand the test? What happens when we pass? Does the resurrection answer the question? Absolutely. The resurrection has already arrived. King David said, I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's where I'm going to be. I'm going to dwell in the house forever. For me, that means is that I, along with all those who have gone before me, am just outside the door of the fullness of God's grace. When I think about it, a faith that doesn't help you when you are dying won't be much good to you when you are living. When Jesus walked out of the tomb, the people of God walked out with him. Uh, there's an old song. Uh, we don't sing a lot of the old hymns, you know that, but up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph over his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with the saints to reign. He arose, he arose, he arose. Hallelujah, he arose. The empty tomb says he's risen. The di disciples said he's risen. The church of Jesus said he's risen. All creation knew he, he rose. Jesus has conquered our last enemy. He solved the problem of death forever. So in what sense did he do it? For 2 Timothy 1.10, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who has destroyed death has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. The word translated destroyed means he rendered it powerless. So he says, does it hurt when a saint dies? No. I answered that too quick, didn't I? No. Powerless. No longer. Doesn't hurt. Amen. Over with. And one day death itself will die. John eleven twenty six. 26. Whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Death for the believer, temporary interruption. Temporary interruption. You ever been watching a, a, one of your favorite TV shows and all of a sudden your satellite goes off? You got dish too. <laughs> and you're sitting there and it's a temporary interruption. There's a good Astros are up. l two V's up to bat. And all of a sudden the TV freezes. 
frustration, mad, upset. And then it comes back on, and he's coming in home. Temporary interruption. That's all death is. Amen. The resurrection answered all that. Amen. Come on, y'all too quiet in here. So how did he destroy death? He could only conquer death by entering the realm of death, yanking the keys from, yanking the keys away from that devil, pulling them right out of his hand, unlocking the door, and marching out on triumph over the grave. Revelation 1.18 says, I'm the living one. I was dead, and behold, I'm alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and hell. Come on. I mean, I think of that. I, I, I'm, I'm, my mind is so colorful, picturesque. I, I think of Jesus in the, in the tomb and, and, and all hell rejoicing and excited over his death. They, they've wrapped him in all of, these, all of this stuff, amen, to make him smell good for days. And, and there inside the tomb, he lays. And they rolled that stone over. He gets up. He looks around the room, has no candles, no light switch. He don't need it because he's the light of the world. So he's just lighting up the whole room. And then he says, well, I guess it's time to go down yonder. I've been waiting on this moment. I created this earth. I created everything in it. And somehow... And this is what blows your mind. He enters the place of the damned, and he removes the keys from Satan. He said, you know what? You have, you've, not, you've not been nice with these keys. You've been holding these keys over people's head of death and hell and the grave. You've, been, you've, you've not been a good steward of these keys. You've been taking it for bad. You act like somehow you're a god with these keys. You fuck out. You're just a fallen angel. The only power you got is what my father gave you. So give me them keys, boy. And then he resurrects. And he says, listen, you are not allowed to exit this world until I give you a green light. And you may not know why a loved one passed when they did. But when you get to the other side, you'll get your answer. But he has the keys now. That's why I have confidence. You ever got in a vehicle with somebody and, and you just sit there? And you look at them and say, are we going anywhere? And they go, oh, no, I don't have any keys. Well, why are we sitting in this truck? Well, I thought you had the keys. I ain't got the keys. Oh, I know who's got the keys. They're in my wife's purse. <laughs> he holds the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Now, I know that during communion, we ask God to forgive us our sins. But there's a presence moving in this resurrection morning. With your heads bowed, just for a moment. There needs to be more than just, God, forgive me. I need to commit myself to serving the one who has the keys of death, hell, and the grave. There needs to be a commitment out of me. And perhaps you've never done this in church. And I'm not going to have you stand, but I'm going to have you show God your hand that this morning you're committing yourself to serve God the best of your ability for the rest of your life because he resurrected for your sake. If I'm talking to you, I want you to put your hand up right now. Just commit. Some of you never committed. Others are really committed, but some of you are not. I want you to pray this with me. Lord Jesus, on this Resurrection Sunday, I commit myself to serve you with the absolute best that I can for the rest of my life. You are my Lord. I confess you as Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I love you. Amen. Come on, give God praise in this house. <laughs> Hallelujah. He took away your doubt. He takes away your guilt.
the answers to questions to death. Amen. Come on, Jesus. Come on. Takes it all away. If I get our servant leaders just to come up here and stand just for a moment. Opportunity for God. I know you've read this, but when we get to heaven, he'll wipe away all our tears, Tommy. Put that right here for me, sir. He'll wipe away all our tears. There's an envelope in front of you. Be a giver this morning. Honor the king we've given. Those watching, you're going to give online. Before we get to this place, I'd like for Pastor Joseph and Josh to come stand with me. A couple of months ago, we brought Josh Bounds in. Josh, did you know that I did not know till this week that you are 22? I know. I thought he was so much older. No, no, let me just say this about him being 22. He is mature. There's a, uh, listen, there was a time at 13, 14 years of age we considered men mature that they were old enough to go do things. And many, by the time they were 16, were in the military, fight for this country. Back in the Confederate and the Union Wars, men were fighting young. Women were giving birth early, 13, 14 year old. My mother was married at 15, had me at 17. You know, uh, we, I don't know, some reason I think we've waited so long for folk to grow up. So thank God for Josh. The scripture tells us in the book of Timothy, and Paul's seen it, one of the things I've learned as I've gotten older is that I'm getting older. 31 years of pastoring, over 40 years of ministry. Whew, it's gone by fast, my kids just keep moving. So as it happens, we ask God to raise up people to help us. Pastor Joseph has been serving this house, myself, for nine years now. Would you give him a hand? Paul said to Timothy, Timothy was a spiritual son of his. And Paul said to Timothy, he said, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. That, that's what we do. So I look for Pastor Joseph as a son, and I pass a baton to him. For now, he becomes the associate pastor of the Little Country Churches. He wasn't hired in to do this. He matured in to do this. He grew in to do this, too. Weddings, funerals, loving our teenagers, building up two, four youth groups, raising up a family. And somehow in all of that, he still managed to help Skylar have two children. I don't know how he done it, but he, he found some time. Now as the Ford youth pastor and student of ministry, he passes it on to reliable men. So at this moment, we receive Pastor Josh Bounds as our student minister. Amen. What's been great about this transition is you cannot have a good transition unless you've got good people. And people that understand that I, I don't like it that way. I like the old way. I like what we I, I like the old carpet. I like the old pews. And one day you're gonna own these pews. Amen. I'm telling you, this house is growing. 
It'll continue to grow. Amen. So here's the thing. Pastor Joseph will be discovering his role as an associate. The things that take place. He'll be looking over the ministries in the house. I saw the flashing of so many ministries. He teaches the round table for men on Tuesday mornings out at the ranch. There's so many things that go on. But we'll also be assisting Pastor Josh and looking after him and helping him as he navigates his way with our teenagers. Learns to grow with him. They love him. He's raised up in this house. Amen. So this is this is where we're going. So we had a lot to cover today. We got 11 going to Guatemala. We got this new group uh, coming up in ministry here. I love this house. You say, Pastor, does this mean you're going somewhere? Yep, I'm going to the next church and do this again. And hopefully, hopefully, nobody will pull out in front of me in Jesus' name. As we give today, we're believing God for. Gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts to mileage, royalties received, favor, success to the kingdom. Little Country Church, it's an honor to serve you. It's good to be here, good to be in this house. Nine years. It's been a joy of mine. And I look forward to many more years or whatever God has for us as a church. Uh, I believe, I know we say this a lot, but we're, we're on the, the brink of something at the Little Country Church. And I believe, and I tell the students all, this, all the time, change means God's working on us, which means he's got a plan for us. If he left us alone, then we need to stop. We need to start worrying. But he's not leaving us alone. He's got a lot of things for us. Speaking of a lot of things, uh, April 13th, we have our CIS conference coming up. We're really excited about it. Yes. If you've never stepped foot in this church before, you're visiting with us or you haven't been here in a while, please go see Bethany in the back. Uh, she took over CIS, uh, ladies' ministry, both campuses, do an incredible job in this conference. It's the second time they've done this. Uh, and you need to go sign up. You need to be a part of this. So it's coming up in two weeks. A lot of great things planned for that. So make sure you go see her if you have any questions. This week is first week midweek, Tuesday and Wednesday. Be here at Tuesday at 7 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, and then Wednesday out in New Caney at 7 o'clock as well. Uh, we encourage you guys to be here for that. It's, it's really a good environment. And just sitting down, getting into the Word. It really is. It's great. So be a part of that. April 20th, uh, there is a cafeteria crew needed uh, for uh, Muscar Sunday. We need uh, cookies and brownies uh, pre-packaged that we can give out. We, we do this huge Muscle Car Sunday every year, and uh, we give away free food and free dessert, but we need your help in getting those desserts, so please help us out there. And then, of course, April 21st is Muscle Car Sunday. Yeah, we're excited about that. That's at our North Campus. Uh, we usually have thousands of people show up. It's a free event, but it it's succeeds because of you guys and your investment and your ability to serve and help us out with that. So just be praying about where your place is in that and how you can serve because there will be opportunity. Uh, and if you, of course, you have a muscle car, you have a four by four, you have a motorcycle, uh, please show up with that as well and, and enter it into the competition. Bait, probably a bake off. Are we, we're not doing that this year. Just kidding. You didn't hear that. Um, uh, but there'll be plenty of stuff going on. So a lot of great things. Make sure you uh, are jumping in there uh, and connecting. And then we have stuff all week long with different ministries. Uh, and there's needs and stuff. So just be listening, paying attention uh, where those needs are. And if the Lord calls you up for that, just be ready. Would you stand with me? Also, these awesome new announcement slides. Kate has been helping out a lot with our media. If you've seen a lot of new stuff on Facebook, she really kicked it up a notch, next level. So y'all give it up for Kate and everything that she does. All right, let's pray. Father, uh, we just thank you. Because the cross is empty, anything is possible. Father, when we place our lives into your hands, 
Lord, there is no limitations. The only thing that limits us is our own fears, our own securities, and ourselves, because you set us free. And I pray that we walk out of here with that freedom. Lord, that we give, we, there's new life to us because the cross is empty. Not the cross, that's empty too, but the tomb is empty. Lord, this is all for you, Father, and I just pray that we will live like it, that we represent you well, not only today, but with our lives, that we'd honor you not only today, but with our lives every single day in this journey. Lord, this is all for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You guys have a great week. Love y'all.